Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello, lovely listeners. It's so good, as always, to be with you again to just talk about early years stuff, right? I mean, I know we do it as a daily basis, but sometimes we just need to chat with people about what's going on. And at this time in the year, you are going to be thinking about your children and how they settle into their new environment, right? Well, this episode is just for you because I've got two of my really dear friends and colleagues, Julia and Louise, to come and talk about attachment theory, which is, of course, going to really affect your children at the beginning of the year as they start to separate from their parents and carers and settle into a new environment. But before we get there, let's start with a really uplifting praise a practitioner segment. Let's hear what you've been up to. Ruth would like to celebrate her friend Morgan, who has just started a new position at the International School of Milan. My gosh, have fun, Morgan. What an exciting adventure for you to start in a new country. Well done. Laura would like to celebrate Sam Cunningham at the Reculver Primary School for taking over the reins of EYFS and getting off to a wonderful start. Oh, that's always really tricky, isn't it? Well done, Sam. Keep it up. And last but certainly not least, Ellen would like to celebrate Emma Jenkinson at Kingham Primary School because she is an incredibly dedicated EYFS lead who, despite having several responsibilities, such as Deputy Head and Senko, always has the time to advocate for early years. Oh, it's always good to have an SLT presence for early years. Well done, Emma. Oh, wasn't that lovely? It's really difficult at the beginning of the year, isn't it? Um, To think about all the things that we've done well and our successes, because, you know, the start of a new year can be quite chaotic, can be quite noisy (laughs) um, while we get our children to settle in. And it's really lovely to hear these stories. I also really wanted to take a moment as well to celebrate all of you, because It's been a really tough couple of weeks. Not only do we have to deal with um, a new cohort of children trying to help them settle in, but also we had the death of um, Her Royal Majesty the Queen. And of course, that really affected our jobs. Uh, We had to have difficult conversations with our children about what was happening. And we had to support our parents, our carers, our families in a really unique way that isn't something that has been seen for 70 years since the beginning of her reign. And it's been a difficult time for our families, but also for us as well. There's been lots of changes. We've had to adapt really quickly and really pay attention to to what was going on in the world and change our environments and our teaching to to support our children in that. So I just want to say to everybody, well done for having those difficult conversations with children about the Queen's death, about the transition, supporting families and having to change everything in light of what happened. So well done. Now, as we're talking about change, of course, The beginning of a new school year or a new term is, of course, really, it's a big change, isn't it, for us and for our children. And one of the biggest obstacles that children might face when they start a new setting is separating from their parents, their carers, their previous nurseries, their familiar adults, their childminders, and starting a new setting. And a lot of children might suffer with separation anxiety. So we noticed this is obviously a really big hot topic at this time of year for you guys. So I thought, you know, what can we do to help you? Because it is a really big topic and it's quite difficult because every child 
reacts in a very different way. So I've got a special treat for you today. I've got my wonderful colleagues, Julia and Louise, who actually work for Twinkle and spend their time looking at this and developing resources for you so that you can support your children with separation anxiety as much as you can. So today we're going to have a big chat about attachment theory, how children form attachments, especially at the beginning of a school year or a setting session and how that impacts their development. Hello, lovely ladies. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and chat with me about this expertise that you have in this area. I mean, I'm an earliest teacher, but I don't know it all. I really don't. Um, So I'm so, so, so grateful that you guys are here. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself to our lovely listeners and tell us a bit about what you do? Happy to be here, aren't we, Luke? <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy. You don't sound it. I mean, a little bit more enthusiasm. <laughs> we're we'll bringing it. We're we'll bringing it. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I can go first if you like. So at Twinkle, I work on everything EYFS CPD. So that ranges from videos to making posters and handouts and PowerPoint packs. And that's what I've been working with Lou on, specifically on child development and theory. So we've been looking at attachment and loose parts theory, lots of different areas. And before all that, I was a teacher and taught in the early years and beyond. Mm. Yeah, even up to and beyond. beyond. Goodness, you sound like bars, <laughs> aren't you? <Ooh. laughs> well, I mean, beyond is like up to, I think there was a 70 year old guy I was teaching at one point. No! Hey! Oh my god, I love that. That reminds me of that um thing in the news a couple of days ago. The ninety-six year old who d- redid his master's yeah, thesis. That was so nice. So cool. yeah. right. Learning is at any age. Exactly. I love that. It's never ending. <laughs> We're always learning. Um, and um, I work in the early years team as a content writer. Um, and I've been working with Julia on the um the training CPD aspects as well. Um, And then outside of Twinkle, um, I trained as a primary teacher, particularly with early years. Um, And now I, and I've been a teacher for 20 years plus, so a long, (laughs) long time. And um, now I am working with Twinkle, but I also own my own messy play company. And um, I also do some training of in forest kindergarten. So my goodness. for, For teachers. So I was going to say jack of all trades, but it's Lou of all trades. Yeah, sort of dip in, dip <laughs> yeah. into lots of things, but it's all all fun. So. It is. I think that's the beauty of early years, isn't it? As well, like you can you can do lots of different things like that, which is really nice. And one of them is coming to talk to me today. So thank you. And um, what we're going to talk about today, as well, is I, I think is really important, especially. Um, at this period of time, mm-hmm. when children are starting school, they're starting nursery, they're starting preschool, or they're starting a childcare setting for the first yeah. time. And that is a massive it's step, a isn't it? It's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for the kids, for the parents, for the families, and for us as practitioners as well. Um, and so we really wanted to kind of get into the nitty gritty of the theory of attachment and attachment theory and all of the the things that go behind it and and how it affects our practice our kiddies our classes our families and and what we can do so first question is probably the obvious one um what is attachment theory what is how can you define attachment well I feel like the theory is a little bit different from attachment itself so attachment we've talked about and kind of came up with a definition together in terms of it's an emotional bond between a child and a caregiver. And then there's so many reasons why that's so important to children. You know, it helps them to feel loved, respected and understood. And they need that in order to feel safe to learn. Mm. So it's so crucial in what we do. And attachment can affect children far beyond the early years. And that's really important to note as well. And that was something that the theory recognised they noticed that if children struggled to form strong attachments, then later down the line, they found themselves with more difficulty socially, cognitively, and in different ways. So it's something that's really effective for children. Mm, Kind of underpins everything, doesn't it, really? It is a foundation. I mean, they can't learn effectively without good, secure attachments. Well, this is it, isn't it? It's like, if you think about yourself, if you're starting a new job or you're going somewhere new, if you don't feel safe valued welcomed like you say you can't really do the job you can't really feel engaged in that area and things like that so I suppose it's 
kind of a, a similar thing but just for children yeah. and it's when we you know even years and years ago we had that fight and flight response and that mm. can happen in children too and they're stressed if they've got lots of stressors then they can't calm down and focus on anything apart from their own safety right and that's just about their own development and that's how our brains work yeah so we can't possibly focus ourselves if we don't feel safe yeah and that's the same for them right so that's kind of like attachment then so where did this theory come from can you explain that a bit more yeah so it initially came from John Bowlby so people might recognize that name because it's often talked about and then Mary Ainsworth built on it and she did an experiment where essentially she had lots of children and their parents come in and then she did this strange situation experiment, which it is quite strange. And I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think you should really do it to children. What but, did you know. she do? <laughs> so basically, the parent was in the room and so was the child and the child was playing. And so she went through lots of different stages. But essentially, she took the parent away at one point. So the child was by themselves and they saw how they reacted. And then even at one point, a stranger came in and they saw how they reacted with them, which, yeah, I mean, that's difficult for children. And, yeah. But, you know, psychological experiments, they do get a bit strange. <laughs> and then at one point, the parent comes back in. Right. And Cute. it's often, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everyone goes home with who they came with. Oh, my gosh. That's the one panic, isn't it, in early years, especially in those first couple of weeks. Exactly. <laughs> like, was, was this definitely the person who brought you? <laughs> we have pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... The whole point was to see how the child reacted when they got reunited. And some children, that really showed a lot about their attachment styles. You know, if they were comforted by their parent quite quickly and they were upset when they left, they usually have secure attachments. Whereas if they ignored their parent for a long time and actually kind of went to do something else and they came back in, that would show signs that actually they had maybe a more difficult attachment style and it wasn't as secure. So it gave some insights into the attachment style. Well, this is it. This is quite interesting because you, especially it's like coming from a practitioner's perspective, you'd think that, oh, you know, if, if the parent, if the child ignores the parent when they come back in, you think, oh, great, they're fine. They don't actually, they're not bothered. They actually, they're independent. But then you're saying, oh, no, it's actually an indicator of a difficult um, attachment there. So uh, what are the different kinds of attachments? So there are four, and this is only in this case, you know, because it can be very different when children have settled in and it doesn't mean that there's bad attachment there, just in this strange situation, because they might have got used to the practitioners at that point. So Mm. it's not black and white. Yeah, as with everything, yeah. But this, because it was a one-off, it was slightly different. So there's basically four different attachment styles. The main one that people know is secure attachment. Mm-hmm. And then they understood that there was an anxious resistant attachment and then an anxious avoidant attachment and later as well, a disorganized attachment, which was really hard for children. So you can look these up separately and also people might refer to them as just anxious or just avoidant. So it's quite tricky when you look it up, but that's why we made this PowerPoint so that people can. So essentially we have a PowerPoint all about attachment that helps talk you through it. And then you can kind of find out, oh, how does this affect children? And also sometimes it can make you think of children in your care mm. and think, oh, this child needs more attention and more support and a close relationship with the parent to make sure that they feel safe and happy. Mm, that's really good. And uh, in terms of the PowerPoint you were talking about, we're, obviously we're going to be referring to this really handy tool uh, throughout the entire episode. What I'll do as well is I'll put a link in the description so that uh, wherever we are, or if it's Spotify, Apple, wherever, you just click on it and it'll take you straight there. So you could, you can even have it up and listen as you go and go through it with us, which would be quite cool. A little bit of interactivity going on here. You can take the teacher <laughs> out of the school, but you can't <laughs> take the school out of the teacher. I just, you know, it's one of those things. Um, but actually interesting about that, in terms of the four, is it four different attachment styles? Mm-hmm. What what would they look like in a setting? How would a parent or a practitioner kind of um, recognise which is which? What are the signs? What are they looking for? So as always, there's no, you know, one thing and every child is different and every relationship is different. So what can be nice, I think, in early years is sometimes we get to do home visits and you get to see children in a different environment to your own which is just a nice beginning to start to understand where do they where are they coming from essentially and maybe how many adults they live with and things like that can start to build your understanding of children and then that first kind of few days will be really key to seeing how parents say goodbye as well I mean that is a really big part of the settling in process Mm. I know that when I was working 
even children that were very secure parents weren't ready to leave sometimes and that made it much more difficult so I mean there's lots of moving elements it doesn't just rely on their attachment styles also relies on you know how the parents feel about leaving them in the first place even if they're really secure so I mean there's lots of different things to look out for and just in general once they've settled down notice you know how long it takes them to settle down and also their behavior once they do are they unresponsive passive angry anxious or have they kind of settled and managed to enjoy themselves with something I mean these all help to understand children's attachment better Mm. no it's really good and it also kind of leads back into that unique child doesn't it which is what in the entire early years is all about it's that you know we could we can give as much um advice and 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 uh what you call it um I I don't know why cursor is stuck in my brain because I know it's not that word but you know, like we can give little points to to direct you and little north stars of this is what you need to look out for. But mm. essentially, it is about knowing your child as well, and and that's a really good point actually about parents because I just did an episode about school readiness, and you know we're really good as practitioners as settings as yeah, as an education system as a whole in terms of supporting our children. But gosh, what about our families and our carers? So important. It's just as so big important. a deal for them, isn't it? Especially if it's your first child or, you know, especially because of COVID. So everyone's been at home with their children a lot more. It's a really difficult thing. So like you say, a child could be more than happy to come to nursery. They're ready to go. They've spent two years at home in the garden. They've had enough. They want to crack on with life. But the parent might not be ready and then that impacts the child so that's a really good point thank you very much Julia um so in terms of approaches there are some approaches I believe that we can use Lou is that right in terms of what we do in the settings to support these children yeah so one of the main approaches um which everybody will be more than likely very familiar with is the key person approach um which obviously has been established to form those close attachments between the child and the caregiver when they're in the setting. Um, And that is probably one of the most important relationships Mm. for a child and its family when they start in, in school or when they transition to a different setting. That sort of relationship needs to be focused on the emotional side, but also the caring for the child's physical needs as well. Um, And that can be from changing nappies to feeding to having a cuddle at at nap time and just really tuning into what that child needs at particular times of the day. Um, And that in itself helps to secure um, an attachment for the child with the people that they spend a lot of time with in the Mm. settings. You know what I think that's really quite nice about that as you were talking, it, it's all going back to the curriculum again, isn't it? Those prime areas, making sure Definitely. we've got, you know, PSED at the heart, the physical mm. communication and, and it marries up and that's really nice. It's nice to see that actually, yes, <laughs> what we're doing is making yeah, sense and this is why. <laughs> and I think I think if you keep the child at the heart of mm. everything that you do as right. a practitioner um, and as a, a setting as a whole, um, that actually that is one of the most important things you're putting that child's needs how they're feeling their feelings will go up and down during the day um and and that will inevitably make mean that a child feels safe they feel that they can trust the adults that are there with them um and that they can actually have meaningful interactions and that closeness and connection that all children and all all people need. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, I'm like, I know we're talking about children, but I feel like... <laughs> we all need to be loved. I, yes, I need to be loved exactly. too, guys. Yeah. Yes. Can someone just do this for me as well, please? Can, can <laughs> yeah. I have a key person? <laughs> yeah, sometimes you need someone else to give you a cuddle because you're right. feeling sad and that's okay. <laughs> oh, I yeah. love it, guys. A virtual hug, virtual hug. Guys. <laughs> um, but this is the point. I think this is really important, isn't it? Because I, in all my 10 years, I've, I've had, I've used key workers. I've always had key workers in my nursery and my reception things like that I didn't know it was based on an attachment theory and an approach and that's probably what 90% of the <laughs> practitioners who are listening are thinking oh oh yeah I was doing a thing I didn't know I was doing a thing I'm doing a thing great so yeah definitely. can you tell us a little bit more about maybe perhaps where it came from or how it works or you know what what the process was for key worker approach what did they see or how did it come about 
that, so there's two different terms that we're really using here. There's the mm. key worker approach and then there's the key person approach. And that is that's quite significant in how that has changed over the years. Oh, right. So um, the key worker um terminology that used to be used because obviously it's changed more free more recently to um key person that that sort of role was viewed as being sort of more of the organizational the information about the child and as theory and research has developed over time it was felt that the key person approach was to do with with all of what I've mentioned to do with the key worker in terms of the organisation and the information about the child, but also that emotional relationship. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a very small word change, but actually it, it, it involves encompassing lots of different factors into, into the, um, the role as a key person. And really, I suppose it's come from um, lots of child development um, theory and research. Um, and one person in particular that people might be familiar with is Peter El- Elfer, who was mm. a um, lecturer um, in child development. And they, well, he particularly did some research around very young children and the fact that they do need positive um warm and meaningful interactions with with a with one or two people preferably two because in a nursery setting or in a setting we know that that one person can actually sometimes get called away yes. so actually mm. by having two people that a child um can form a, a very strong attachment with is is beneficial because mm. often you see as well don't you like if it's just one key person or what like you say one attachment to one person if that person's off sick exactly then that child feels lost don't they and that's really difficult and it's like they can't make that transition to be able to still continue on with their progress just because that person's not there and in the end it's kind of not hindering them but it's going backwards in a way because now they're not independent they're they're dependent on just a new person and it's not developing yeah, and they're them. just left they're just left waiting almost yeah. until that person comes back so yeah having one or two key people around that child is is definitely beneficial and by sort of developing that um, relationship, Peter Alpha uh, suggested that the children would feel less stress, less anxiety, mm. less feeling of abandonment when they leave their their primary caregivers, which would ul- ultimately lead to uh, the best outcomes for learning if they don't feel stressed and they aren't highly anxious and they don't feel abandoned, that they're waiting for their caregivers to come back, that actually they, they are allowed to to fly and to enjoy yeah. themselves and, and to feel safe. Yeah, it reminds me because uh, I was just saying earlier, because part of my role is as well as I go into schools and I do phonics training uh, for schools, this is the first September in 10 years where I haven't welcomed in a new class. And it's mm. a bit weird. And mm. I'm like, oh, okay, I should be like preparing transitions and going to home visits and hearing screaming children because, you know, in the first half term and everything that you were saying, it's just brought me back to those little faces and they were just like the children who were struggling, who did feel abandoned, you know, they're, they're pouring at the window, like, why, why am I being left here? And it's really hard, isn't it? And then it's really nice to see that when you think back at the end of the year, oh, they're totally fine. They're flying. They're not bothered. And you can see, you can see the impact, can't you? You can see the difference and why it's so important. But can you tell me, obviously, it's not just the kids uh, and the children and us that are involved here. Why, why is the key worker, excuse me? change my, my terminology I've got to keep up with the times but the key person approach what impact does it have on the parent and the carers and the families because obviously they're important as well yeah so one of the other um sort of terms that is quite often used um is uh, the triangle of trust so that is one of the significant things that a key person needs to embrace and connect with the with the parent as well, mm. the, fam- the family around the child. So the, t- the triangle of trust is the important relationship that is it forms between the child, the family and their key person. And no person in that triangle, it, uh, they're all equal. Mm. So um, the child's really important. The key person, obviously, is really important in developing that relationship. And um, the family and the parent and the carer is is of equal importance in that relationship 
um, that forms. And for the child, the key person obviously becomes the attachment figure that they will um, they will form a close relationship with when they're in the earliest setting. Um, and then for the parent, the key person is that 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 bridge between the home and the setting, and um, and the key person's role in that is fostering that relationship and helping to hold the parent in the the uh, the, the child's mind while they're while they're away from them. So, and that can be things like the key person talking about the significant people in their life while they're away from them mm. um what they what they're doing when they get home what they're going to do tomorrow what they might do during the holiday so that they're bridging that gap so that the parent is always sort of sort of there mm. even though they're physically not there that actually the child is felt that their their home is celebrated isn't it really celebrated yeah. Yeah. and included yeah because like you say I think the, the thing about early is isn't it is that we try and reflect life real life for these children mm. especially at that age it's you know a lot of settings might do their first topic of um all about me or mm-hmm. you know me and my family and it's bringing like you say it's bringing that in and make you know making sure the kids know that just because they're not at home that's it you can never talk about your parents again it's the new world (laughs) forget them we are the new people it's you know because probably a lot of children might think that especially after covid if they haven't been out in another setting Mm. it's going to be terrifying because they're thinking oh my god where is my home where is my bed where is my mummy um but like you say bridging that gap is so important And, and to do it in different ways as well um I think a lot of settings, um, we'll go into this in a minute because I did do um, a little social media outreach and I asked our lovely practitioners that follow us on social media what things they do to support children. And it's really lovely. So I'm going to put them to you in a minute, ladies. Um, but that's really, really nice. And in terms of like the, the there's this, there's something that will always come up and you, you touched on it earlier, Lou, about giving children a cuddle. Now, in terms of when the years have gone by and you know things have changed health and safety gdpr protecting ourselves from i don't know legal cases etc making sure that we are safe professional love it's a it's a wonderful term but what does it look like in practice because we all know especially you know if we're parents and we're early as practitioners especially when a child is crying you just want to give them a hug you do you just want to give them a squeeze because you know what it's like and you know that's what they need But it is quite a a difficult subject because of safeguarding and things like that. So this new term, I think, relatively new professional love term, where where does that fit in and how and how does it fit in for us? Well, actually, it came about because it was so difficult. Practitioners were finding it more challenging and actually because there was a lot of safeguarding in the news. And that all kind of meant practitioners felt nervous about showing professional love. Oh, yeah, I I was. Yeah, I think we've all had that moment because it's something that's been talked about a lot. And actually, it's something that everyone started to reflect on. And professional love was basically a research into that. So Jules Page asked a lot of practitioners, how do you feel giving professional love? And they wanted to feel more confident about that. Mm. And so it's actually exploring that topic. And I think that that looks very different for every setting. And some people, for example, will ask parents when they first come, are you happy for me to hug your child if they're feeling upset? So, you know, sometimes some practitioners will talk to parents about boundaries if it makes them feel more comfortable. I think it's very important to start having that conversation with parents. I agree. And also talking about the fact that we're not there to replace them. Mm. Not all parents will think that, but they might, you know, subconsciously be you know, nervous about their child going to a new setting and a new person being in their life. And it's just important to have those conversations with them and say, why is attachment important for your child? You know, it's really important that they feel safe and loved. And I'm part of that equation. And what do you feel happy with? You know, we can talk about that. And you're part of that conversation, really involving them in it. And actually, just to add to that, by asking that question, you find out so much information around what different children need and what Mm. children, because for one child, a a hug might be the right thing. For another child, actually, that would be completely the wrong thing. (laughs) And and so that's actually respecting the wishes of the child and bringing Mm. them, uh, going back to what we were saying earlier about them being at the heart of Mm. everything that you do. Also the bridging the gap between home and setting. I think, you know, 
like you say, they're going to do different things at home and you don't know what that is. And just the more you talk about it, the more you find out what makes them feel comfortable. Some child may find it more comforting to be in a really small space and feel like that is safe for them and they need that space in the environment but you don't know when you know when they first come in whereas someone else might feel like that's too confining Mm. and they want a cuddle instead yeah and so like having those conversations like you say just opens things up and you learn more about what the child needs because yeah well just like adults you know some of us don't love hugs as much as others (laughs) I'm (laughs) definitely a hugger guys I don't know I don't know if you've guessed already (laughs) I see in your eyes (laughs) thank you I'm just like giving you the eye like I can't I can't touch you but I'm hugging you with my eyeballs yeah (laughs) hugs are great uh you know that love like they love languages like yes, physical exactly. touch, like that's yeah. for me. And I think you're, you're right. I mean, I think that's definitely something we're starting to talk about more as adults, aren't we? And especially mm-hmm. in terms of the safeguarding thing, consent is a big thing. And so it should mm-hmm. be. It's taken too long, in my opinion. But it's here now. We're talking about consent and we're having yeah. those conversations. So why should it not be the same with, with children? Absolutely. And talking with the parents and just having that open conversation. If your child is upset, how would you like me to respond? How does your child best is best comforted? you know, and things like that. And I think that's a great idea. And I think a lot of settings are starting to hopefully feel, like you say, feel more confident and feel braver in that. Because I I do believe there was a period of absolute fear. It was do not touch in under any circumstances. No, do not touch a child. And it's kind of gone, not the other way, but we're starting to see that actually, especially at that young age, especially to do with attachment and comfort, emotional support, I think especially after COVID as well, where we were not mm. allowed to touch, like two two meters, get back. Yes. You know, <laughs> not having that for everybody, even adults have gone, oh, hang on a minute. If this is affecting mm. me, mm. it's going to affect our children too. So the conversation's evolving, which is, which is really good. So yeah, having those conversations, are, are there things that can help as settings and parents have have those conversations or do you think that's something that you know maybe the education system still you know might need to work on I think that it's something that's essential in the settling in period definitely I think that that's like a necessary conversation whether you have those kind of meetings at the beginning with all parents or whether it's something you mention at home visits and also I think it's important to know amongst yourselves amongst the setting because if a child like the same child cries and one does not give them a hug and responds completely the opposite to another Mm. kind of adult in the setting, then that's really confusing for a child as well. So being on the same page together is really important as well as talking yeah. to parents I mean it's, it's kind of like what do they used to call it we don't call it that now but like behavior management you know you have to be consistent in your behavior management <laughs> strategies well okay well it should be the same for when they're feeling happy when they need mm-hmm. comfort it shouldn't just be if they're struggling um to to I don't know um keep in with the boundaries and the rules of school if that's the case we should be looking at all types of behavior all types of emotions and having consistent strategies for all types which is you know I think that's lovely and that comes into it as well which is really nice so as I said um as I said earlier we did do a little social media shout out um I said to them uh we've got Julia and Lou come in from Twinkle Team um, and we're going to be talking about attachment theory. Is there anything that you you want to know? Because these are the people that are going in into settings and they're, you know, kind of uh, first responders, as it were, to, to, to the emotional uh, side of things. And we did have a couple of questions. So the first question is from Tom Maris. And he would like to know a bit more about um, the implications through later education, such as secondary. He uh, has had experience of maybe colleagues believing it's just an early years thing, but we know it's not. So how how does it all fit into the bigger picture? I think that's a classic. Uh, as an early years educator, we're like, early years is so important because <laughs> it's laying the foundation for everything. Yeah. And so the attachment is exactly the same. If children have struggled with secure attachments from childhood, then you will see that later down the line in in secondary, not in all cases, because, you know, you don't like to paint with the same brush every child because we're, as we know, they're all unique. But it does affect them in terms of if they've had a really difficult time forming attachments when they're younger, they may have then struggled to focus, to learn, their development may have changed as well. And so sometimes it does set them on a different path. And children will have 
lots of different experiences with attachment. Lou and I talked about this for a little bit and said, you know, even if they've had a very secure attachment with someone and they lose that person, Mm. that will have an effect on them too. Mm. And it means that in secondary, you still have relationships with children and they still feel that. You know, you still have to make that bond in order for them to feel safe to learn. If they're in a secondary environment and they feel unsafe or, you know, there's a teacher that often is shouting at them and things like that, then that's not an environment that they necessarily feel welcome, safe and ready to learn. And, you know, some of those behaviours may come up, especially in times of transition. You know, primary to secondary is a huge transition. Absolutely. And some children will go back to that initial you know attachment style and feel very nervous because they don't know anyone at a new school and it can even be from year group to year group if they're changing form tutors that will be a big attachment for them as well and that'll be someone that's consistent so it's important to think about if there is a child showing more challenging behaviors is there a way that we can tune into them and help support them and is attachment possibly one of the causes Mm. and I think that's you've made a really important point there that I think sometimes you know we're all guilty of forgetting is that attachments aren't just made when we're little we go through life we make you know we we make friends we lose friends we change jobs we have different colleagues you know we change schools circumstances change in our life too Mm. and how we respond to them right exactly we could have we could be bereaved Mm -hmm. you know and so attachment is is there throughout our entire life and so there that you know we are gonna it is something that is a lifelong journey and to be able to do it throughout not just early years but in terms of it as a whole in terms of education even at work I mean we've got you know a lot of well-being sectors and companies now to 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 think about things like this and they all kind of if you think back down to it you know a lot of it comes back down to some form of attachment theory so it is it's really important isn't it so I'm, I'm glad you brought yeah, that up. I mean yeah. relationships are a huge part of our lives and I do think that people stay in things because of relationships and that is often based off of attachment I mean I know that if you ever watch any of those school shows in secondary school some people will say you know I love this subject and I stayed in school because of one teacher yeah. you know they will refer back to someone and that is a really important part of you know them feeling safe and enjoying learning and, you know, having that opportunity to really tune in with someone. And that's an attachment. I mean, I keep, when you were saying that, I was thinking as well, like, we've always got that one teacher that we'll always remember, right? I've got mine. She was called Miss Reed. She was my reception teacher. And I remember her, like, I could, don't know why. Obviously, I clearly <laughs> loved her when I was four years old. She had beautiful, blonde, curly hair. She was really tall, really lovely. I just thought she was a fairy. And I will always remember her name. I cannot remember what I did in that class. Can't remember a single thing, but I remember her. And I remember how it made me feel. Exactly, it made you feel. Yeah, I felt safe. I felt loved. I just, I remember. I I can't remember what happened, but I remember how it made me feel. And I think that's something that we do need to be aware of as well, isn't it? Sometimes it's not what we do. It's how we make people feel. Yeah, and somebody showing genuine interest and Mm. involvement in your life, not just seeing your life as when you're in school actually taking an interest on on all factors to do with you is is hugely important whether you're an early years or you're secondary based yeah absolutely absolutely so tom i hope that answers your question we've got another question from neve ann and she was just wondering um what advice do we have in terms of being gentle on parent or carer and child she says she feels the whole process in terms of transition settling in etc has become quite institutionalized it's a big deal for all involved especially if the child hasn't attended a nursery environment previously so what what can we do how can we be gentle i think that it's linked to the question we just answered in terms of being authentic and genuine Mm. i think that changes it not feeling like a process yeah and also validating their feelings i think is a really big part of that you know acknowledging that this is scary and it can be nervous you know you're allowed to feel nervous and that's normal Mm. because you know this might be the first time they've left their child like for a long period of time Mm -hmm. and just validating that is a really big part of it and I think it as long as you bring it back to them and a unique child and their unique parents and their and all carers then I think that makes it more more gentle and it's going back to that triangle of trust again isn't it it's about engaging not just thinking about the the child it's the whole whole 
process around the child. It's where they where they started from, where who, who's important and significant in their life, and what they're interested in, and the emotional side of the parent pe- plays a massive part yeah. in that. And the, and giving people time, um, mm. and the and the whole transition doesn't doesn't shouldn't be rushed. Yeah. Um, because otherwise things do end up for the parent or the, for the child feeling unsafe or mm. sometimes you just need that time to process don't you we all do yeah and there's never too much communication I think as well I agree. because I think some things on our side we know that it's good for children to settle in we know that we're going to be an important part of their lives and a key person but that's not always obvious mm. to parents and especially if this is their first time with a child in an educational setting, communicating that and being open to, you know, talking about it is, is really helpful as well. Mm. I like the point that you said as well about, in, in terms of the triangle of trust, you know, all all three parties are just as important. So uh, would you have any advice in terms of how to be gentle to ourselves during this time? Because, you know, coming from experience, that first half term at least is, is it's really tough because... Yeah. A, the noise, pack paracetamol, that's what I'm going to say, you know. But it's not that it's a, a bother. We understand. We know why. It's really difficult and you want to try your best and you know it takes time and you just want to give them a good and you just want them to know that it's going to be okay. And it's stressful for practitioners. Mm. How, how can we be gentle with ourselves? Yeah, I think appreciating how emotionally invested you are in it, like appreciating that you're – I mean, that's why it's so tiring because tuning into children – it's it's difficult Mm -hmm. like it it takes a lot of energy and I think that's often why we're so tired in general Mm. because we're giving a lot of ourselves and we're trying to be there for children and meet them at you know where they're feeling and just being super kind to yourself you know as as kind as you would be to your lovely little children be just as kind to yourself definitely and give yourself a break Mm. because it's not easy Mm. and and standing back and reflecting I mean I think reflection is so key in 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 the whole process of transition and settling in because sometimes if something's not working Mm. you know you're quick to try and try something else but actually standing back reflecting on it talking to others talking to your colleagues Mm. can sometimes actually just little tweaks here and there there, um, can sometimes make things a lot easier for yourselves Mm. or or for the children or for the parents I agree and I know we were joking about it earlier about you know me as an adult grown adult wanting a key person but (laughs) having that someone that you can you know um check in with you know perhaps if you're in a two form entry setting your partner teacher can you can you check in with each other is it your phase leader is it um your nursery manager I think that's always really important as well that you know it is tough that first half term and do you have support there as well do you have someone that you trust that you feel safe with that you can just blurt out at the end of the day when they go oh how's your day been and instead of the usual very British yes it was fine thank you how was yours? <laughs> like actually just letting it out yeah uh, I think that's probably really important as well as you know whatever we do with our children and that triangle approach a triangle of trust we can also do with ourselves too so do you have people that you can check in with I think is really nice and making time for non-teacher talk Mm, (laughs) non-practitioner talk just you know time to be you as well outside of your role Mm. which I think sometimes it's hard really hard to do in September I feel like that's the battle isn't it every every, 10 minutes really important (laughs) where is that 10 minutes Julia I can't figure it out I've got planning to do (laughs) I know but it makes it so much better doesn't it it does when you've when you've had that little yeah. a little you time <laughs> I agree I agree I love it I love it so um this is the really nice part now I wanted to share with you guys um what our followers on social media have been saying because I asked them you know what kind of techniques and things have you oh, been yes. using to help your children with separation anxiety and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read out some things for you so feel free to respond in every way um Uh, Rachel writes we had one mum leave her handbag with the child she had one prepped I said to leave and it worked a treat I love that can you imagine a little kid walking around with a giant handbag just around (laughs) I love that you need that familiarity and and they'll come back it's the knowing they'll come back yeah I've got her bag she has to come back the keys are here (laughs) yeah I think that's such an important conversation as well making sure that you say goodbye and not Mm. running out on them without doing that sometimes because 
drop and go sometimes might yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, tammy has listed a couple actually she says some have got photos of mum and dad or the family etc printed for the child to hold and talk about while they're in the setting and she has also seen a little heart drawn on the child's hand Mm. and one of the um one of the mum's dad's carers etc when they need a hug or they're missing their parent they put their hands together and the child is getting a little hug. Oh, oh that is so cute. Isn't that cute. I love that. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Get a biro, Junior. Just you just let me know and I'll, I'll do it. We'll Everyone's going to be like, are you okay? But yeah. <laughs> Um, a lot of people have said, actually, a, a book called The Invisible String. Quite a lot of people have said that that's really Ooh. helpful. So if you're thinking if maybe a story might be helpful, mm-hmm. that's one a lot of people have recommended. Um, Rihanna says, we have parents who leave an item with the child and ask them to take care of it until they come back. So mm-hmm. throughout the session, if the child is mm-hmm. missing them or feeling anxious, we remind them, oh, mummy and daddy will be back soon. Remember, they need to pick up their so-and-so. So that's quite mm-hmm. nice. It's like giving them a job to do as well, a bit of purpose. Um, oh my goodness right this one is really really sweet Debbie says I gave my son a photo of us both and wrote a poem on the back specifying Mm. how much he has loved and by the time I'd be picking up it helped him massively oh my god wrote a poem wow (laughs) I love that I love it (laughs) <laughs> a lot of people have said as well having like a scarf or something that smells like home mm, just to have really that multi-sensory nice, yeah. experience is, is really good yeah actually this is something that a nursery did for their new families so Ali says my grandson's nursery provided wooden hearts for parents to take home and decorate and then bring with them into their first Ooh, day of nursery that's, that's, lovely. Lovely. that's really nice a nice shared experience as well mm. and then they bring it in and they remember I yeah love that. exactly I used to have children um, have, with lunch boxes with little messages on oh, napkins and things. It was so really cute. lovely. Oh, I've always cute. loved that. I'm like, I would never be upset to see a note in there telling me how much I love it. Oh, like, yeah. Who doesn't want that? Just a heart on something on the yeah. bit, on the post-it. I oh, love it. Oh, this is a cute one. Right. Carly says, a heart drawn on the palm of the child's hand and one on the parents. So what they do is at the door they hold them together and they charge it up before the parent leaves and the parent <laughs> leaves right so it's full it's full charge fully charged i know <laughs> right and then if they ever feel like they're losing they're losing charge all they need to do is start they just press just press the heart and it's charging them up with their parents love again oh, so, <laughs> cute. so lovely this is adorable this is so cute i love it oh so yeah there's loads of really nice ways that nurseries and settings um are clearly already doing Yes. to help provide so isn't that just lovely it's just heartwarming to know that you know it this is. is something that settings are already aware of or already working on which is which is really lovely and they work that's just yes. they're just so lovely I don't know it's cute it makes it? your heart warm doesn't it it does I really like I want someone to do all of these things with me like, why isn't someone drawing a heart on my wrist and charging there's no it? stopping you <laughs> I'll hold you to that Julia we'll do we'll do a thing together <laughs> got lots of love to give oh um so yeah that is kind of the end of the the whole nitty-gritty of attachment theory uh thank you so much for coming is there any like a put before we do the end of the game guys don't worry i haven't forgotten about the game we're, we're, we're gonna end on the game um is there any kind of like end message anything that you would like to you know kind of sum up and let our listeners know i think in terms of what we talked about beforehand it's just keeping in mind that everything we've said you know it's so different for every single child And I think that that's one of those things when you look at theory, it's important to remember because sometimes it says, you know, this works for all children and it's just not, it's not necessarily the case and things do change and children's attachment styles can change as well. And so just remembering that even if they come in and find it really difficult that they may become more secure later and just to treat every child like, you know, they are unique as they are. So for me, I'm going to go back to what I've said quite a few times probably is that holding that child just at the heart of everything you do um, because obviously you're going to be in a classroom with loads of different children but actually what's again what Julia said what's right for one child might not be right for another but it's about finding your way and finding a rhythm in your in your practice to make sure that every child is cared for in in their own way. (laughs) You guys making my heart melt over here thank you <laughs> now not to like change the vibe or anything but would you rather teach your edition this is like life or death questions okay 
Are you ready? <laughs> I'm worried about this. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stressing you out. Okay. Yes, the tone has changed. <laughs> Like we need quick fire answers, and I need some like oh. hard hitting definitions as to why. Hard hitting. Yeah, oh, I need wow. to hear. I need to hear why. Okay, I've had some really like watery excuses. I need some, watery. I, yeah, it's, it's you ridiculous. want strong coffee. I want strong. Well, this is my first strong question. Answers. You've already got me there because the first question is always the same. Okay, okay. would you rather tea or coffee? Coffee. Tea. Why? Come on. Coffee. I. <laughs> I can already hear the wateriness in the answer. <laughs> I like better. <laughs> great, that's a great answer because I like it. And <laughs> I feel like the smell alone is pure joy for me. Oh. Like the, and the process because I will probably sound like a muppet, but I love coffee so much. So we have like one of those grinders. Me too. The beans and that smell. It's pure joy. <laughs> See, it depends what mood I'm in because sometimes I'll like it and it will smell like a coffee house. And I yes. will not mention them because there are many and I'm not favourite again. There are many coffee houses that I'm sure is coming to your mind right now. <laughs> but then there are other times where it just smells like tobacco. Oh, I've never had that. Have you not? Have you? You've definitely got beans there, have you? Oh, well, well, <laughs> might check the bag then, might be wrong. <laughs> but Lou, tell me about tea because I'm team tea as well. So tea for me, I mean, I'm quite particular on my tea, but I've never, I've just never been a coffee drinker ever. Mm. And I think coffee can be too, it's quite a strong taste for me. Mm. But tea for me, again, it's a bit of going back to the process of making a cup of tea. Mm. I love a brewed cup of tea coming from a teapot. Mm. Um, for me, the best tea of the day is the first cup. Oh, it, you're so right. Yeah, it is always the best tasting tea. And then for me, really, the rest of the day can sometimes be a bit of a disappointment. It's going downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. But maybe it's something to do with the time in the morning. Mm. I have just, I, I give it a ritual of making mm. my first cup of tea and making sure that it is brewed exactly right. And it has to be strong with only yeah. a little bit of milk. Well, this is it. This is this is another, you know, question. Milk first or tea bag first? I don't have milk in my tea, guys. Drama. Oh, what? <laughs> well, who are you? Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> oh don't belong. Just kick me off now. <laughs> well, the kit, for me, it's it's it because it's brewed in a pot it would be the milk goes in and then the tea port gets poured what what oh, I feel like this is going to be yeah, a battle but this if is... I'm making it if, if I'm making it in a cup I would put the tea bag in first and let it brew and then I'd pour the milk in but you wouldn't do that with a pot of tea that makes no sense no because I know exactly how much you milk brewed it already. and I brewed it mm, yeah different tactics. guys I feel like this is more controversial than anything I've ever spoken <laughs> yeah. about forget the entire episode this is the entire podcast <laughs> yeah like milk first or tea first is the biggest like you know that thing is it a blue dress and a, or a black dress that thing I feel like this is the next thing what always tea bag first if you put the milk in it tastes funny so you can't put mean? you but you can't put the tea bag in if it's in a pot why i do if i put a pot in i stick the tea bags in oh no that's what yeah so you brew the tea in the teapot oh, we're getting cross <laughs> cross wires <here. laughs> but i would i would then pour the tea into yeah. the cup with milk so even right, okay. Let me try and visualize this for our <laughs> listeners because this is like this is why I need descriptions. So you fill your your pot, you got your tea bags in. It's brewed for a couple of minutes. Then you pour it into the cup. Then you add the milk after. No. Why, Lou? <laughs> why? <laughs> I brew the pot. Controversy is real. I give it its time. I give it a little stir. I nurture it. Oh. <laughs> so much love. <laughs> give the love to the, the attachment is formed. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, I'm attached to my tea. The triangle of trust between the pot, the milk, and the cup. And me. And you. <laughs> That's getting square now. Yeah. Now it's a square, it's a triangle. And yes, then I have my cup with the milk already in and I pour the tea in. All right, there has to be a poll afterwards. I was going to say, I'm going to leave this to our listeners because I, I so. might be getting some really angry emails and uh, <laughs> I'm going to forward them all to you, Lou. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I am I'm Switzerland since I don't add milk. 
<laughs> yeah, you don't even come into it. We're just going to ignore you, Julia. You yeah. don't even put milk in. Like, what is that? <laughs> don't exist. Um, so question number two. <laughs> I feel like that was really intense. I'm pretty I sure know. the other ones will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> question number two of would you rather teach tradition would you rather in your spare time watch tv or read books i feel like i want to say books but i spend a lot of time watching tv right. so i'm not sure that i'm making the right decisions in I, my life. i'm with you <laughs> it's like my my brain wants to choose books but i'm just too knackered yeah. Yeah, yeah too tired yeah, yeah well for me it's books but I don't really get a lot of time to do that. Mm. And I don't really watch much television. Oh. So what do I do? What do you do? <laughs> you're Luke? questioning you know your life right now. You're, right, you, you're filling the teapot is what you're doing and you're putting the milk <laughs> in the cups and that's taking up all your time. Yeah, I, I know so. what you're doing, Lou. You're cleaning up that messy plate. Uh, that probably is. Mm. <laughs> that is yeah. probably what I'm doing. <laughs> Without shaving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't want that in your tea. You got to make sure that's proper clean. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> so books probably for me. Oh, see, I'm the same. I'm a. I love books. I absolutely adore books. I do love a good book. I just feel like I never sit down and read it. Right, but I'm just it's knackered. Terrible. And like sometimes you just want to do nothing. You just mm. want your brain to be mush. And I feel like TV <laughs> is the easiest way to do that. Yeah. But you know, quick hack, guys. If you want to do both, stick subtitles on. Because then you're technically yeah. reading. You're technically reading. Yeah. That's true. Isn't it, right? I just fall asleep if I watch the television. That's also true. But then I'm doing nothing. Well, that is what I'm doing. That you're is sleeping. what I'm doing. I'm sleeping. <laughs> Which is also one of my favourite things. So I'm not even yeah, going to. I do agree. It's up there. <laughs> <laughs> and third and final round of Teacher Would You Rather. Would you rather country or city? I'm going to go country. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I live in a city, but I miss the country so much. Oh, where do you live? I live in London. Oh, uh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, I've just made boo. the move. I've literally moved from London to the northwest. But didn't and... you move to another city? No, next to another, next to Manchester. Uh-huh. I'm not in Manchester. I'm okay. next to it. Okay, okay. like literally, <laughs> I'm right next to a farm, and I can tell you that Ooh. because I don't see it. I smell it <laughs> but I'm happy it's fine like I think I got woke up the other day at like three in the morning because there was just I think a sheep had escaped its paddock <laughs> about four in the morning all I could hear is meh down the road I was like what is that? what's going on making an escape <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant I'm like Running no country country is my life well, I, I like the peace country. and quiet as you guys know, I like to grow fruit vegetables. Oh, I like so. the animals. So, yeah, none of us are city girls, eh? No. 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 Good. The greenery. The outdoor right. space. Yes, yeah. and the, the the less people. Right? Yes. Yeah, no Classic. people. We all want some, some space. Ironic that yeah. we, we work in a people-facing company. I know. Uh, the, yeah. But sometimes you need your alone time. I agree. With you in the trees. Oh, my God, we love the trees. The trees are our friends. And obviously Ozzy. Oh, oh yes, yeah. we haven't spoken about Ozzy. You have a dog oh, called Ozzy. I do. <gasps> Lou, share your fun fact. Oh, yeah. So, well, there's many to do with Ozzy because he is... Special. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very special animal. So, But the one I was going to share, really, with everybody was that um, he really, really doesn't like the song Happy Birthday, which is quite a challenge. Oh, my God. Because as soon as you, he hears it, even when it's, ah, he just starts barking and he doesn't stop until you finish. Oh, can I do it? Can I do it? Oh, he can't eat because you put your headphones you. on. Yeah. Can you take your headphones out? No. Mm. No, why not? <laughs> so a spoiler. Okay, in another meeting, I'm just going to be like, hi, Lou, happy birthday. <laughs> just you know watch. what? He'd probably be camera shy. Probably oh, wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, you've now given me a goal for the end of the year. Make Ozzy howl yeah. <laughs> to the song. Happy birthday. That's, a, that's brilliant. It's not so funny. And I think if you ever want to get out of a birthday party, you just bring him along. And go, oh, yeah. I'm so sorry, guys. I have to leave. Yeah, <laughs> really. So oh, nice. you've sang that. Oh, sorry, mate. Gotta go. Nice. No, yeah. It's the dog. It's not me. Them. It's the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you haven't trained him? <laughs> Maybe. That's my secret. <laughs> Your quick exit. <laughs> Well, you guys are a bunch of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been so lovely to talk to you. Just had to have a laugh. It's really great. And to share your amazing expertise. Um, don't go too far, guys, because I will probably ask you to come on another episode. Just letting you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Oh, great. You're great. 
Have a lovely day, guys. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Well, there we are. I really enjoyed the last section of Would You Rather. I think that's the funniest I've ever done it. These are the conversations that we have at work. This is why I love these two ladies. Um, not only are they full of knowledge, but they're just they're just goofy and hilarious like me. Um, wait, that was a big brag, but you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um, so I'm definitely going to have these guys on again to share their expertise. They're really they're really knowledgeable about all sorts of things. I mean, that's why they work for Twinkle, so they can help you. So we can talk about uh, loose parts theory. I'll get them on to talk about other approaches as well. And if there's anything that you want us to talk about, please write in. As you know, this podcast is for you. So if there's any topic that you're struggling with in your practice or something's coming up in your settings, let us know and we can have a chat. Or if you have something that you want to talk about and you feel that you could share with the rest of the early years world, get in touch. You know where to find us. We're all over social media. I'm sure you've seen my silly face on TikTok. Sorry, not sorry. Um, we've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We've got Pinterest as well. Um, just send us a message. It would be really good to hear from you and it would be great to have some feedback about the episodes that we've done so far. We've got some really, really exciting guests coming up for the rest of the year as well. So I'm just, I'm super excited and super blessed to be able to have chats with you um, about subjects that really matter. So let's keep it going, right? But that's the end of it for today and I can't wait to speak with you again soon. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today. day.